Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this edition of the MASHREC Sustainability Dialogues, a webinar and podcast series where we pursue some answers to the pathway to net zero for all of us collectively as individuals, as companies, and as economies, societies. How do we put together the building blocks of sustainability that ultimately creates an outcome of net zero uh, uh, and, and tackle the carbon challenge. Today, we are joined by a number of distinguished speakers uh, to tackle a, a specific question on the power of collaboration. How should different sectors work collectively towards sustainability? And we're blessed today to have a good representation from industry, from technology, uh, uh, from academia, and of course, from our host, Mashrek. And we're going to start off by giving our host, Shaquille Hyder, Chief of Staff, Corporate and Investment Banking Group at Mashrek, the opportunity to set the scene, to set the stage for us as we tackle this question of collaboration. Shaquille, please, your opening thoughts. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sean. And thank you for all the participants who have joined into the webinar. And thank you uh, for the esteemed speakers who have taken the time out to, uh, to speak about this very important topic. So when I um, uh, read the topic on collaboration, the first thing that came to my mind was the most quoted definition of sustainability. And this was quoted back in 1987 until date. It is the, still the most quoted definition. It was quoted in the United Nations General Assembly and also published in a report called uh, um, published in a report called um, our common future and uh, the definition uh, is that the sustainable development uh, is the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising on the ability of our future generation to meet their own needs now, when I look back, this is 36 years ago that this definition was quoted. And looking back, it seems that we have already uh, compromised the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And um, a lot of work needs to be done in a collaborative way in order to reverse some of the damage that have already taken place. And the, the collaboration, in my view, has a number of dimensions to it starting with the collaboration between the public and private sector to drive the capital flows to, to sustainable projects where the public sector as well as the private banks uh, have to work together along with a number of other uh, agencies. The second is collaboration between um, the, the banks, the rating agencies and the governments in order to standardize the ESG measurement and risk framework. And the third is to focus on collaboration between various corporates, civil sector, entrepreneurs, academia, to ensure that the synergies and efficiencies are met. And finally, the and last but not the least, I think the concept of systems thinking and basically embedding ESG into the entire ecosystem is of paramount importance. And I think I think all of these are focus areas for for the COP28, which, in my view, is a COP that goes beyond intentions into real action. And uh, the four key focus areas in COP28 do include uh, the mitigation, where there's a focus to move towards clean energy, the adaptation, where there's a focus to ensure that. Um, ESG benefits are equitably distributed even to the marginalized communities. Uh, finance, where there's, there's a focus on directing the capital flows to sustainable projects and operationalization of loss and damage, which again makes it more global than, uh, than regional. So with these opening remarks, Sean, I will pass it back to you. Um, and thanks for giving me the opportunity. 
Thank you. Thank you for hosting us. Uh, let's welcome industry's voice first, which, of course, is in some ways the anchor of where the rubber meets the road. Uh, Philippe de Snood, the Chief Risk Strategy and Sustainability Officer at Aqua Power. It's always interesting in some ways to observe how companies and institutions are uh, as, uh, as aggregating, if you like, the role of sustainability. And sometimes you see the chief financial officer is also the sustainability officer. Here we have the chief risk and strategy uh, officer, now also the sustainability officer. Philippe, we welcome your opening thoughts. Of course, collaboration is the core of aqua power and, and, and power generation in general uh, operating uh, in the region region and anywhere. Your thoughts on the theme today? Yeah, first of all, um, uh, thank you for having me and, and hi to everybody participating. Um, yeah, of course, I mean, the, the, the whole sustainability and, and whether it's, I think now it's, it's, it's on the climate changes, but that is also the social and the governance part. But it's, it's basically, the, the typical thing about this is that it impacts everybody. It's not one issue that you say, okay, we're going to look a couple of industries together. No, it's all. So collaboration is, of course, you cannot do it without it. It is impossible. Now, there's, of course, a very complex uh, thing. We in Aqua Power, of course, are in, in our regions where we are, um, our customers and our partners in long-term uh, assets are mostly governments. So that is something that there is a natural collaboration because the governments have their um, um, their objectives. And I think governments are in this whole sustainability thing, very important and because as you said, there is the COP, which is basically at a global uh, level, but is mostly governments. Okay, now the industry is coming in a little bit more, but basically it was governments with commitments on the government level. Well, it's a treaty at the end of the day, and governments make treaties and obviously invite yeah. companies and NGOs to participate on the sidelines. Yes, and, and there, of course, there is the whole thing, because you can do it both ways. Huh? You can do these things law-based, and you can do it voluntary-based. Law-based means the, the, the government says you should do this or and voluntary-based is industry, we would like your help, can you do this and that? And, and that is still a little bit, some is law-based, some is voluntary-based and the, the more urgent it becomes, the more it will become law-based. So I think it's important as an industry that we do voluntary-based to avoid too much law-based. Well, we can't be waiting around for industry for too long. Isn't that part of the problem that yes. we need the top down approach, the top down direction yes. and destination because industry and your peer groups have, you know, been not necessarily leading, let's say. No, 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 no. It's very clear. And, and I think there is something in between now that you see coming up, which is what I call the incentive based. The United States are, of course, now with their inflation reduction act, the big guys would say, okay, guys, we're not going to impose you, but we're going to give you a bunch of money if you do it. And that probably will help as well. We've seen it in Germany for solar uh, 10 years ago, so it helps. Now, of course, for the industry, we have, of course, um, shareholders, stakeholders. So, okay, there, there are a couple of things that we should take into account. And the sustainability should play also for governments, I think, in the, in the classical triangle between sustainability affordability and reliability. Because you can go to renewables from today to tomorrow, but you will have an issue with affordability and with reliability. So that's why more and more we're having to look at models on transition. And, and therefore there is a collaboration necessary between governments and industry. And like I said, the industry should, in my opinion, be really trying to be voluntary based and, 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 and be, be part of the game, because otherwise I think there will be a lot of law-based uh, actions. Well, certainly uh, the direction from upon high is becoming clearer as the matter becomes more urgent. Uh, let's welcome Hazem Nabi, Regional Technology Officer, Middle East and Africa for Microsoft, which of course is of itself nearly a focal point in which different sectors come 
together uh, and have to work uh, collectively. Uh, I wanted to get Hazem Nabi's opening comments on the question of different sectors working collectively towards sustainability. Uh, what does that look like to you, Hazem? Yeah, thank you, Sean, and thank you, Shaquille, for running this and inviting uh, all of us to be here with you. Uh, let, let me start by, by maybe reflecting that on from, from our long journey or our learning as, as Microsoft. As a company, we've embarked on, on, on our sustainability journey quite back since probably 2008 and 2012, where we've had early, very early goals on sustainability and on, on carbon and so on. But throughout the past 10 years or so, we, we've learned a lot of things. We've learned that really to, to make progress on this journey, it's an ecosystem, right? You, you can easily control your first party impact, right? You can easily control your first party carbon emissions uh, in, in scope one, but, but really to make an impact, you have to look at all of the problem together, right? Which, which means everything in the supply chain, which then when you start to think about that and we started to look at how we can solve that, we realized that we cannot solve it on our own. We have to enable everybody in the ecosystem, everybody in the ecosystem to really contribute so that we can make uh, progress. And at, at the core of this, we as Microsoft see that data is going to be the most critical component of that. If we can't measure it, if we can't record what we're doing to the climate, if we can't record how our journey is progressing, it's going to be very difficult for anybody to really say we're making progress or we're not making progress or even taking corrective actions, applying laws, doing anything. And at, at Microsoft, we feel that our role comes in the data component of, of sustainability, right? How do we make sure that we're enabling every part of the ecosystem to really capture the right data points, store these data points, and then process them through different solutions without going into too much technical details on, on the technology side of it. But at the core of it, we believe that technology has a huge role to play in bringing the data to everybody so that they can take the right What about decision. when it comes to the sharing of that data? I didn't hear that word in your summary there. And that'd be the idea. And when we're talking about multi-sectoral solutions here, we not only have to have each sector do their part in gathering and, 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 and aggregating their own data, but then for solutions to emerge, that cross-sectoral sharing of data, how do we cross that Ruby Cube? How big a challenge is that? That it's it's a massive challenge, honestly, and it really requires the transparency. The problem is not the technology to share the data. Sharing the data technologically is the easy part. It's the transparency. It goes back to the policies and the legislations Philip was alluding to, to having policies and legislations that make it mandatory to have this data transparency across the ecosystem. Once that data transparency is, is available and is shared, it could be moved across the different uh, components of the ecosystem. One of the examples maybe I'd like to, to, to mention very briefly, Please. what we're trying to do in, in, in Microsoft with a um, an offering that we're putting to market, which is called environmental credit service. And what environmental credit service strives to do is to really create an ecosystem for the different players to come together, right? So as, as, as we look at carbon and we're looking at offsets and, and so on, there's a huge market emerging now for carbon offsets, carbon credits, and the trading of that. And, and for every organization, it's going to be very important to make sure that this is being managed across the ecosystem. So as Microsoft, we're putting out an environmental credit service as an offering that integrates with the technology and with the different data points, but it allows everybody to bring in. So if you're basically providing carbon credits, let's say through science-based or environment-based carbon credits, like through planting trees or through technology that eliminates carbon, then you're offsetting these carbons in a marketplace. That marketplace also has verifiers that verify that these credits are real. So it has the issuers that issue the credits. It has the verifiers, so the verifying organizations, the global ones that verify that these are real credits are not just a bunch of 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 non very non real credits and and this type of fraud that's been happening in the in this type of 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 area recently so you have the issuers you have verifiers and then you have the purchasers and all of this comes in in an ecosystem that exchanges this data seamlessly across so we we feel that at microsoft we have a responsibility to provide the technology that enables the ecosystem to collaborate and work together well it's interesting uh, our uh, fad uh, khan deputy department chair of computer vision sustainability champion at mohammed bin zayed university of artificial intelligence of course another similar focal 
place, isn't it? The university, the area of academia, you sit in the middle of multiple stakeholders like a bank, like Microsoft. You are, in a way, a conduit. I welcome your opening thoughts, Fad. And, and, and in particular, uh, are you seeing or how would you see cross-sectoral collaboration in the Middle East? Is it a unique form? Uh, is there something that you are seeing from your vantage point that gives an outlook for that landscape? Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Uh, first, uh, um, I would like to first agree with uh, what Hazim and uh, Philip mentioned about uh, uh, having a strong need uh, uh, for cross-sectional uh, collaboration um, as well as uh, accessibility. Then, um, as you Does, mentioned- Do you I see that as academia. your role? Is that something where you have a, have a I mean, you're a, 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 a AI university driven by the leadership in Abu Dhabi. Is that a critical part of your raison d'etre? Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, I would like to mention here the importance of academia, as you mentioned. I mean, I, I strongly believe a collaboration and partnership between academia and industry, as well as public and private sector, is actually the key to achieve the desired objectives. And uh, Mohammed bin Zayed University of Artificial Intelligence, here we are fully committed towards conducting cutting-edge uh, research work in order to develop novel AI solutions that Applied can be or, or basic. Are you going to be on the edge where it's going to have application or is it going to be deep in the academic space? Both, both deeper in academic space because we need to uh, to have uh, come up with the novel solutions, for instance, in drug design and discovery in climate change, as well as uh, having uh, a mechanism uh, to promote this research and transfer it to the industry and to the uh, to the end users. This is both uh, equally important in order to achieve these goals uh, um, for us. So, you know, in summary, to put it simply, uh, I believe artificial intelligence can enable our future systems to be more productive for the economy and for the nature. And for this to, 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 to have to achieve that, uh, we actually need a very strong collaboration across different sectors. As uh, Hazi mentioned, for instance, uh, um, in, in terms of accessibility of data, but also uh, uh, preserving the privacy of the data and ensuring that it's, it's actually safe to operate with the data. I wanted uh, to go back to the point that was made a little bit earlier uh, at the start of our conversation by Shaquille. Shaquille, discussing the area of financial collaboration, the access to capital and where that sort of meets in this nexus of the new challenge. I mean, a, a bank's key metrics uh, in the past and for most companies, and obviously still very much the, the key metrics uh, for Aqua Power and others, is profitability. That was it. That was the sole North Star. Now we have the triple P, planet, people, and profitability. I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit of how you make that adjustment from one metrics to three and the intersection of those three. Yes, I think I think the... Uh, most important aspect of this is uh, established fact that, you know, over a medium to long term, there is a massive positive correlation between uh, sustainable investment and profitability. So the banks have now realized that, you know, the entire concept or the thought of short termism um, will not be will not bear fruits. And the, this is quite, um, uh, you know, uh, you can see the evidence of this in a number of things, you know, the land de degradation, um, the the floods, the physical uh, risk that the climate change has posed, a number of uh, investments uh, where ESG risk was not properly measured, resulting in losses. So that's basically created awareness on, on, the, on the climate side. But the same goes for uh, for the social and governance side, where there was lack in the governance policies of the banks. Uh, again, they that uh, has not uh, yielded great results. So I think the first point to make there is that you know from a from a uh, from a perspective of bankability or commercial viability, there is a clear cut uh, focus and move towards um, sustainable projects. The second point is that you know the entire uh, the colla what collaboration actually results is um, a collective move towards such sustainable projects. So there is a there is um, a, there is less uh, focus on profitability, immediate profitability, when you actually start sort of 
committing to a net zero and committing a specific amount of capital to be deployed because then you're looking at at the long term benefits rather than a short term uh, profitability so those two points coupled with with the fact that you know there are uh, multilateral development banks there are government subsidies there are uh, there are products which uh, which are actually very beneficial um, and and more commercially viable than just doing clean lending on on the ESG projects. Well, so Philip, I'd that, like you to, uh, just to bring Philip in there to pick up on that because inevitably, uh, Aqua Power uh, has been, uh, Aqua Power creates uh, uh, power from natural gas. It creates, but also power from renewables, and has been at the forefront of some of the the groundbreaking price. Uh, economic uh, efficiencies in renewable solar power generation. I wonder if you would speak to us a little bit, Philip, about whether we're seeing unique partnerships emerge in the Middle East. What was the collaboration between government, business, civil society that allowed some of these breakthroughs to achieve some of the lowest cost solar power generation in the world from this region? Yeah, first of all, that's for sure. Yeah, our, our, uh, we have, of course, a legacy. We are a company that has been around, so we still have some fossil fuels, but but we, we definitely, our our uh, focus right now is renewables. And we always have been, even in the past, we, we said, okay, one, one of our missions is to, to be a cost leader. We want to bring power and water to the societies at the, at the, at the most affordable price. And uh, now, mostly we are in an environment where there is bidding. So governments are putting a bid out. So anyhow, it's the lowest cost who wins. Huh? Now, the big advantage, I have to admit, which, which has changed since the last 10 to 5 years, is that renewable power is the cheapest power. But how so, did we get there? That was just didn't happen. I mean, in this region, is, the collaboration from government, they made very large amounts of land, for example, available uh, at, 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 at very competitive prices, let's say. Yeah. First of all, there's the technology. If you look at the, at the prices of solar panels and wind turbines, it has been dropping phenomenally. So naturally, you get you get scale, and and, and and renewable energy is the cheapest energy. Of course, it's a different type of energy. You need a lot of land. You need uh, certain specific permits, and that is of course where governments come in, and they have to facilitate all that because you cannot do that especially in our regions, you cannot do that alone. And, and you see more and more that, like, like we are working a lot in, uh, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the, 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 the projects are immense. If you compare that to Europe, where you have a couple of megawatts, because in Europe, of course, the space is not there. In, 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 in Saudi, we do two gigawatts of solar at one time. And that makes also the cost advantage. If you put such big projects in scale, the price drops as well. So in essence, you're saying there, sort of in, in, in contrary to the earlier points, that regionally, the government policymakers are on board. They are giving clear and direct destinations for companies and other stakeholders to point towards. Oh, absolutely. I think if, I, if I'm using two, two examples, which are, which are very clear, which is the Emirates, huh? Uh, if you see what what uh, what we're doing in Dubai, a solar park that is not far from where I live here is is immense. Huh? And then if you go to to the KSA, if you look at their ambitions for the the number of gigawatts of, of renewable power, it's unique in the world. Huh? So of course the drive there is there. There's no issue. It's not people like Aqua Power who say we will do that. It's the governments who say come and do it for us. But you have to be competitive. You have to work in partnership. Because, okay, I mean, you have to follow the rules of the country. It's not that you get a free, free uh, uh, blank check. Eh? It's still no. competition. But, but of course, it's, it's very, very close collaboration with the, with the authorities. And overlaying that, of course, uh, as we talked earlier, is, is Hazem, is the technology. Where does the technology intersect with that government and industry collaboration? Where have we seen those successful tech partnerships emerge? Well, the tech partnership, that, that is, of course, and now it's very, it, it becomes, it becomes an, an, an issue not, but, but, but a talkative point. Huh? Yeah, let's bring in Hazem on that point, Philip. Hazem, your thoughts on that? 
all these sure. technologies now come predominantly from China. Right? Well, so, China, China and hopefully some other places as well. Hazem, please jump in. Yeah, so on, on, on technology and on, on, on creating partnerships in, in Microsoft, we've, we've, we've been traditionally a company that uh, that does everything in partnership with the with the with the ecosystem so when it comes to technology really as as, as microsoft we bring in first party technology solutions so we do have our technology that, that comes in as a platform to basically enable any type of, of but do of you see it do you see it in particular sectors i mean we're talking cross sector here but is mobility making the progress we've just had aquapower talking about where power has been some real breakthroughs because of land government and policy are there other seg where technology smart cities where are we seeing if you like that cross-sectoral intersection and really make moving the needle so i mean all of the in all honesty i think with, with what's happening in the region in the past two years and in the prelude of cop 27 in, in egypt last year and now going into cop 28 all industries are focused on sustainability and sustainability has gained a first seat position in almost each and every industry. Of course, there are different industries that are making progress at, at different speed, but I and in all honesty, uh, the collaboration and the desire from governments again in the region in the last two years has been phenomenal with the introduction of uh, the concept of, of smart cities taking in, in different shapes and forms of smart cities, of course, in the region, um, all the way from, from Qatar to Saudi Arabia to the UAE smart city concept and the technology playing a critical role in enabling smart city is is one of the critical and and predominant themes we're, we're seeing we're also seeing a lot of energy and the energy sector the energy sector specifically in the oil and gas has been really looking towards technology to come in and and, and help look at the current challenges whether that is with energy on the power side or on the oil and gas side there is a lot of technology adoption today happening to basically take steps ahead on on the journey of sustainability so i would say it's it's all across it's a focus area for governments and the private sector alike in the last two years it has been phenomenal pickup in the region Fad, just picking up on that and, and layering over it artificial intelligence. I mean, if it wasn't the year of COP28 or bankruptcies in the US or whatever, it would be AI, chat GPT, stealing all the headlines. Where does that solution tool come into the mix and particularly in this region when it comes to advancing sustainability? So uh, uh, as uh, uh, Housim also mentioned, I mean, uh, we are also actively collaborating and making partnerships, uh, for instance, uh, with IBM to combat climate change uh, and uh, and uh, weather uh, effects, and also for uh, developing uh, sustainable uh, solutions for healthcare with, uh, with the partnership uh, with the uh, local hospitals, uh, for instance, in virtual healthcare or, or, in, or in some of the diseases uh, where the solutions are still um, not uh, easily accessible. So these are some of the examples of the partnerships uh, where we really see AI being leveraged between the in the academia uh, and and the and and the, and the local authorities and the and and um, the business sector as well. Now you speak about uh, uh, one uh, particular uh, aspect, this chat GPT, because it's making a lot of 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 noise uh, recently. So uh, having well, it is for the first time where chatting. the sense of artificial intelligence has really come down to a retail level it feels and where impact can be made but it's still unclear where that is a tool for sustainability so um, as i mentioned uh, for instance i mean there are uh, tools so, so chat, chat gpt is just one i would say component uh, or or in towards making this large uh, scale tools um, uh, there could be other components as well there are a lot of other ai uh, technologies for instance the computer vision natural language processing and machine learning all of these have to come together to make this uh, large scale solutions or, or at the end uh, uh, things which will make uh, an impact i give an example of uh, the the climate change uh, uh, project and an initiative that we have with uh, with IBM. Here we are actually harnessing a um, lot of satellite and uh, uh, other related data uh, in uh, to make sure that we can come up with some solutions uh, such as heat island detection and and so on um, and also uh, vegetation mapping in order to make cities more sustainable. So in that way, you're really talking about shared goals and values. I mean, quite often we yes. talked earlier about the idea of financial collaboration. You can't just have profitability as your only 
uh, matrix we and, and collectively our individual we can't just have our own self interest we have to see a wider a wider good absolutely uh, it's it's basically uh, as i mentioned it's uh, it's basically uh, to come up with uh, new solutions that are more productive for the overall economy and for the nature so so this is just not just one person's uh, interest at the end it's it's a collaborative collective interest for the whole planet and how do you translate that into my bottom line your bottom line if i'm what's our common interest how do we get that message across so i think uh, uh, as uh, we were mentioning i mean there is a lot of uh, top down support also which is really helping uh, to achieve this goal and uh, and that particularly makes, uh, in this things region move faster yes particularly in this region i mean uae is a very unique place i mean there is a very strong extremely strong support uh, from the leadership across different sectors as uh, so we have the world's first ai university for instance we have a very strong uh, minister um, of ai um, support yes uh, absolutely and all these things contribute towards having a very uh, uh, friendly ecosystem that supports this cross uh, sectional collaborations uh, uh, to achieve this goal well let's go to sort of closing comments on on where we go with this next you know what are some of the next steps for high impact collective action it is the year of action some of you have mentioned it through our half hour together cop 28 the uae government in leading that have identified it as an impact cop i want to start with you philip what are some of the next steps for, for high impact collective action from your perspective from aqua powers perspective I think for us it's important that we don't lose the speed. Speed. I think that's been to supply chain channels, to the conflicts that we have seen in the world, to the geopolitical tensions. There is some kind of risk that people say, "Oh, oh, we have other priorities," and I think that's for us a danger. I think people need to say, "Okay, we have to do this." And also in the US, you see, it certainly the feels that the energy market. security has kind of trumped energy transition in this current cycle, and there's a bit of a grit in the wheel there. A little bit, uh, but but I'm not pessimistic. And I think in Europe, not because, okay, forcibly they have to go to something else. But I think that's for me the message. I think that, that the governments have to not talk, and, and they do as well, eh? but, but the action has to be there. And we in the industry are willing to do it. Is the as we move through the commentary here and go to our other speakers for your closing comments, Hazem, is there the collective the point we made there earlier, the the idea that this is not an individual benefit? We have to somehow get our triple P into a collective benefit. Your thoughts on that next steps for high impact collective action? I, I think basically we have to capitalize on on the whole momentum in the region, right? And to capitalize on that, I think at, at Microsoft, we believe that one of the biggest opportunities we have is to really create the skills and the capabilities in the whole ecosystem. There's a lot of desire, there's a lot of interest in, in the topic, and that's the best moment. So to basically capitalize on that. And I think every organization has a, has a role to play in terms of skilling, whether skilling their direct employees, skilling their customers, or skilling the ecosystem around them on the topic, because once we elevate that level of understanding and we elevate the skilling of the entire ecosystem and community we're operating in, that is what is going to allow us to advance. And so at Microsoft, we've introduced our sustainability business school and our sustainability technology school. These are very, um, I would say, agile and, and, and simple web-based uh, training courses for everybody to come in, join, and, and learn about the sustainability challenges and learn about the technology and sustainability. And, and we feel this is our contribution to really advance that in capitalizing on on the opportunity and the awareness on that happening. point on that point just to to note as uh, are we on par here in the region are we way behind your other markets obviously you operate in every market in the world where are we in that sort of advancement if you like from the point of view of competence and knowledge and 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 skill around the ability to implement the sustainability track uh, the way we see it is a little bit different, right? It, it's okay. difficult to, to say we are behind or we're ahead, right? If you look at some of the very advanced organizations uh, in the financial services or in the power, energy, and industry in the region, they're really advanced in what they're doing, right? So we have some, let's say, like uh, North Star, some people that are really way ahead of the rest of the region. And then we have some, the bulk of the region that still needs to make faster progress 
And, and similarly, in other parts of the world, also there are organizations that are leading and organizations that are lagging. And it, 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 it really differs by industry segment, but the type of the organization and the priorities the leadership have set. So it's difficult to group it all in one. I would say we have some great showcases in the region, but we definitely need to do more and we need to do it faster. Well, there's certainly cases where, you know, necessity is the mother of innovation. We've seen some incredible financial innovation in parts of Africa where there isn't even a, a road or rail infrastructure. But because of necessity, we've leapt forward. Uh, let's give our final word, closing comments to our host, Shaquille Hyder. Uh, again, Shaquille, your thoughts uh, on closing out our session together and also that idea of where next? How do we accelerate? No, thanks, John. I think uh, a few uh, themes definitely emerged. The first one is that, uh, you know, we need to create that sense of urgency and, and basically move towards a low carbon economy. And uh, to all the participants who uh, spoke about the importance of AI and, and technology, the focus is actually um, in, in a term recently emerged, which is called the twin transformation which is the transformation uh, that is basically being um, uh, made by, by the technology and, and collaboration. So that's key. So the second point in, is to, from a banking perspective, uh, to have ESG uh, incorporated in your investment decisions. So that is very key to actually have a measure of ESG in, in terms of capital deployment. And the third point to that uh, is to actually having uh, standardized measurement tools to measure ESG. So currently there are 1,100 different uh, set of uh, tools that are used to actually measure the impact of ESG from a reporting and disclosure standpoint. That needs to be more standardized. And then the fourth uh, point is to make sure that, uh, you know, this is a, a global and a collaborative uh, agenda is should basically take precedence because it's very important for all the, the different participants within the ecosystem to collaborate, to drive towards the sustainable goals. Well, I think it's it's certainly going to be a very interesting six months ahead as we march towards COP28, the COP of impact and the momentum, as Philip mentioned, the speed is certainly, the wind is in the sails, at least in this region, towards having tangible impact. I'd like to thank our 150 people who registered to attend today's webinar, Mashrek Sustainability Dialogues, and for our tackling of the question, the power of collaboration how should different sectors work collectively towards sustainability? It is the critical question. Together, there is clearly more impact. As the saying goes, five fingers doesn't make a fist. A fist is where we all work together and really uh, dent the universe, so to speak. I'd like to thank so much our guest speakers today. Philip Desnoud, Chief Risk Strategy and Sustainability Officer at Aqua Power. Of course, Hazem Nabi, Regional Technology Officer, Middle East and Africa at Microsoft. And Fahad Khan, Deputy Department Chair of Computer Vision, Sustainability Champion. I love that. We should all be so carrying that badge around with us uh, at Mohammed bin Zayed University of Artificial Intelligence. And of course, our host, uh, Mashrek, Rise Every Day. I love that new slogan. Uh, Chief of Staff, Corporate and Investment Banking Group at Mashrek. Thank you for hosting us today for this important discussion. Have a good Thank day. You. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate that. Really enjoy that.